So we are back in the normal room after the what? Two was it two episodes in my yes, house? Yes, I think it was uh, two. Yeah. yeah. So we're back with a Martian invasion. Ooh. We've gone from alligators to aliens. I remember having the um, the video with and it had Attack of the Alligators on and Martian Invasion. So it was the weirdest Thunderbird video I ever owned. Um, but this episode follows the return of the Hood and he disguises himself as one of the high-rolling producers uh, who's budgeting a science fiction movie, of all things. And um, the main reason he's doing this is so that he can actually sabotage the filming of the movie to call the Thunderbirds into action and allow him to take advantage of all the cameras around the area and film the Thunderbirds as they attempt to rescue the actors who are stuck in the cave with the water rising. I just wonder what the producer of this episode must have made of that, you know, the hood being the producer and he's all corrupt. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, it's not just him involved in there this episode, it seems like he's got an entire conspiracy of people behind this. As in, uh, he he seems to have corrupted the man who's behind the funding for uh, this this flick, because you see in the opening scenes that uh, the director really wants a load more money because he's failed already, and so now he needs to get it, and the hood posing as a Mr. Stud. Mr. Stud. <laughs> I'm not going to go there about the guy on the X Factor, Mr. Stud. But, uh, <laughs> he uh, he just uh, has disguised himself as this really wicked producer who somehow has a shitload of money and he's going to hand it over to someone. Someone only identified later on as General X. And there's no clues to the X Factor joke again. <laughs> there's no clues as to the identity of General X. Obviously we've seen the hood work for a couple of people before, we've seen him work for someone in Edge of Impact. But this guy, you know, all you see of him, kind of like Dr. Cloyne in Specs Gadget, all you see is like his hand over the armchair. And um, the only really distinct feature about him is his accent kind of reminded me of the, you know, racially insensitive accent that the... Um, the uninvited. The, un <laughs> the uninvited, the people who spoke like... Blah, 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 blah. He kind of has that kind of accent, which makes me think... You know, those guys in the uninvited, they hated International Rescue. They tried to attack them, so who knows? Maybe it is, you know, from that region. Maybe he might be related to them in some way. Maybe, uh, you know, International Rescue on so many terrorists' hit lists. You never know. You never know, really. So, uh, but yeah, he, uh, as the Hood, you know, has managed to get his uh, hands on the videotape. He's, uh, he's kind of done a very ingenious thing here. He's managed to hypnotise and use his own brother... Kirano as a pawn in his dirty game because he hypnotizes Kirano to disable the uh, automatic camera detector in Thunderbird 1 because he really wants to get shots of Thunderbird 1 but not Thunderbird 2 for some reason because I thought Thunderbird 2 would be more interesting perhaps. Maybe Thunderbird 2 has more um, complicated automatic camera detection systems. See we don't know it's never explicitly stated how much the Hood knows about International Rescue. He certainly knows that his brother Kirano works for him and he can wield a power over Kirano to not only get information out of him, but to make him act on his behalf. But we don't know if the Hood knows who Jeff Tracy is, or who any of the International Rescue employees are, or even if he has a niece at all. Like, there's no... It's very ambiguous as to what the Hood knows and what kind of information he can take advantage of. Except for in that episode near the lake where uh, uh, Tintin says, Oh, I thought I knew him in some far-off way by the way he spoke. So oh, yeah, in the, when he's um, hypnotizing her in, um, I think, mean, what was it? Desperate Intruder, Desperate Intruder the, the, the treasure hunt episode. And then, um, but we were also debating why doesn't he just, uh, you know, uh, kidnap Brains or something? Because, you know, Brains built all the Thunderbird craft, but how do we know Bra he knows who Brains is? Yeah, he might just thought he was some kind of hapless individual. Like, he may not have even known that Brains worked for International Rescue. He might have just thought, oh, here's some treasure hunters trying to fuck up my shit. Um, oh, yeah. Let's bury him up to his neck in sand and make him want some soup. Uh, <laughs> uh, same joke again. But uh, this, um, I, want, I thought what was interesting about this episode is uh, because of the the setting on a, a film set. Because you know we're both you know film lovers, and so we know how a film is made. It's uh, but it was fascinating having a look at how the technology is in this uh, in this setting because we were reminded of a few other Jerry Anderson creations. Looking at it, the Martians in this. Looking, as you say, like Marvin the Martian. Yeah, they've got the helmets and the eyes, and I'm just remind. They just look so. They remind me so much of Marvin the Martian and the Marvin the Martian cartoons. But they also seem to remind me of the uh, the fish creatures or the fish people in uh, Stingray. Anyone who's seen Stingray, these very odd sort of anthropomorphic, uh, anthropomorphic sort of fish animals. They take uh, Troy Tempest and uh, phones. Uh, 
prisoner or so at one point with uh, Marina and uh, they're, they're very evil, deadly people. So that was kind of reminding me. But also, when you look at the technology, there's this, uh, there's this big gun or big cannon or something that they're using, which looks exactly like the Martian telescope in the first episode of Captain Scarlet and the Mysterons, which Captain Black mistakes for a weapon. So what's the likeliness that the young Conrad Turner, that was Captain Black's name, in 2065 saw this flick and thought to himself, hey, that must be what uh, Martian artillery looks like, and then he flies up to Mars and starts off the War of Nerves. So you're saying while he's up there, when the telescope comes around and he does that whole, they're getting ready to attack. He's calling back to his childhood when he remembers very distinctly, distinctly seeing a film about Martians in which they use a similar weapon to shoot people. It's like, let them have it, Lieutenant. But why? It could be a telescope. No, it's a gun. I saw it in a movie once. <laughs> Yes, and the fact that uh, we're talking about a movie set, because, you know, where else do you have uh, hundreds of cameras, you know? I mean, well, we do have hundreds of cameras everywhere today, but I mean, 1965... <laughs> the camera... Okay, but 1965 gives that the benefit of the doubt in the historical context. But uh, it's interesting because you get some very interesting disasters on uh, on movie sets, don't you? I mean... Yeah, I think it's... Um, I mean, I don't think it's... Because this predates quite a few of the more famous movie disasters. Like, there's the Twilight Zone movie disaster that everyone knows about with the helicopter killing the two actors. That changed... That There were lawsuits up the arse with that, and it changed the whole... Um, how you're supposed to deal with, you know, child actors. And also there's the Brandon Lee incident with The Crow. I think someone died in that Vin Diesel movie Triple X as well. Uh, something like that. I mean, people die on film sets all the time. I'm sure someone died making Lord of the Rings as well, but mm. who knows. Someone died on one of the Batmans as well. Someone, like, crashed the Batmobile. Yeah. But um, what's interesting about this episode is that uh, it's not quite so much the rescue that's a real big part of it. So you've, you've got uh, Scott and Virgil doing their fantastic job and discovering the hood as... Still has taken all this videotape with them. But then at the end, in the final act, it becomes this real caper. Yeah, the whole first half is focused on the rescue. In that. It's weird, actually. Like, upon first seeing the episode and the title Martian Invasion, I, in my youth, when I was first watching this episode, I thought the episode was going to be about the Thunderbirds fighting aliens. <laughs> Yeah, like, imagine, um, imagine if John gets uh, kidnapped by Martians. Yeah, I thought that, you know, it was going to be something like Alan going up in space and getting kidnapped by Martians or something. I did always think, you know, especially with what the Martians look like, imagine if Thunderbirds had to fight, you know, the undersea creatures from Stingray, or if, if Thunderbirds had to fight Marvin the Martian. <laughs> he, he wanted to blow up the Earth several times, you know. It obstructs my view of Venus. <laughs> space modulator. <laughs> Just seeing that... See, Marvin the Martian could, in theory, be a very deadly foe to the human race. Well, he would. He'd be a foe to anyone. I mean, but how do we know he lives in 2065? <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, the Bugs Bunny cartoons were around in 2065, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, once uh, once you've got uh, Scott and Virgil trapping uh, the hood on his... Uh, on probably what has to be the best driving we've seen of him all this series. Mm. The a, guy can't a drive a car, but, you know, at least he manages to drive for more than two minutes in this one. <laughs> Yeah, he just ends up in a tunnel, but then eventually uh, they uh, chase him down and he leaves the... Uh, I think he gets trapped by an avalanche created by Virgil with some very interesting uh, interesting torpedoes or something that reminded us of Terror in New York City. The actual uh, rescue of this reminded us of Terror in New York City as well, with it filling up with water. And then you have the hood uh, taking, a, taking on uh, this uh, interesting biplane. So he just gets inside this plane. Now the thing is, there are two planes, or at least two or three planes, if I remember, on this very runway. And he has to get into one that Scott later discovers uh, needs refueling. Yeah, it's like, like I, don't, I don't even know if it was two planes. I think there were two planes, and I think there were some other, like, helicopter-like vehicles. And he gets in the one vehicle that needs fuel. It's just... The yeah, lock yeah. is never on this guy's from side. What he, from, what he, from what he tells, he doesn't know how to fly a plane anyway. I mean, he can't drive a, cl a car. Now he doesn't seem to know how to fly a plane because he's going, Oh, I'm getting control. I'm getting used to this control. What does this button do? He gets to a point where he becomes desperate and he's like, I have to lose them. And then he presses a fuel ejector button. <laughs> so he gets rid of all the fuel that he has left and just goes down quicker. And a la Thomas the tank engine crashes straight into a fucking dining room building. In, like, I don't know, it's just <laughs> a, an abrupt and somewhat fitting end to this bumbling villain that has haunted the Thunderbirds for so long. He also seems a bit gormless and doesn't seem to know his buildings either because he keeps asking the general, oh, can I land near your villa? 
It's not a villa, it's a bloody mansion. It's quite evidently a mansion, yeah. What the hell? Villains are not... Villas are nicer. Villas for villains. That should be a... <laughs> uh, sorry. He no. goes into real estate, I bet you that's what he does. Villas for villains. I mean, talking of, like, the hood doing business, I kind of always thought the whole reason he, like, came up with the elaborate plan to, um you know, film the Thunderbirds. Yeah, sure, a film set does seem like a very, you know, an ideal place to capture incriminating evidence of your enemies. But I think deep down, the Hood has always wanted to be a filmmaker, you know. Um, I could see him being very into, like, you know, Ang Lee and kind of wanting to make the next Crouching Tiger. And so maybe deep down, he's like, I want to make films. I want to you know, express myself artistically. Yeah. I mean, why doesn't he try that rather than try and take on International Rescue? He could make some films that could hypnotise the world. He could be just like the Demon Headmaster. Any 90s kids growing up would have known that, the Demon Headmaster trying to hypnotise the world. You know, the Hood could always have tried that, I mean... I thought more of Fearless Leader in that piece of shit movie, <laughs> Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> oh, really bad television. Don't let me go there because you just have Robert De Niro destroying his uh, most amazing catchphrase. Are you talking to me? That film, I love that film so much for how bad it is. And Robert yeah, De Niro single-handedly murdering his <laughs> reputation. Oh god, Licking the Thunderbirds is Rocky and Bullwinkle, I would have thought, eh? Mm. Which I think was actually on whilst Thunderbirds was on. I think it was on in 1964 as well. So. Yeah, another beloved children's show yeah. back then. But no, I liked, um, I think what makes this episode stand out is, yeah, you've got the whole first half with um, the actual, it's just the premise that stands out mostly, the idea of a rescue happening on a film set and being surrounded by not just all these cameras, but all this weird science fiction stuff that's part of the film set, you know. You see the Martians, you see the ray guns in action, and then you have the second half as well, which is basically just the Hood's final battle, I guess, with the International Rescue Team. Because I don't think he turns up anymore in the series, does he? Uh, which is ironic, because he finally gets the recognition that I guess he's sort of been after, when um, at the very end, it ends with Scott and Virgil watching the film as kind of, I guess, a reward for saving the actors. And they fi after finally getting rid of the hood, and they, they're talking amongst themselves, he's like, hey, you know, I think that's the guy who's been after us this whole time. Ah, oh, yeah, I think you're right, Virgil. We'll get him next time. There isn't a next time. No. This is the last time we see him for the rest of the series. So maybe this was his downfall, perhaps. Maybe maybe Prof maybe um, General X was so angry at him, maybe he made him like his personal slave and ordered him to rebuild all of his collateral damage, bit brick by brick. Mm. But fear not, for should we delve into the straight-to-video films Thunderbirds Are Go and Thunderbirds 6, we shall see him again. I'm sure we will. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if, uh, other than that, this has been a fantastic episode because we love movies and so dealing with movies is we can, so great we can make so many references. Yeah, it's a, um, it was a memorable one, if only for the um, excessive use of aliens and once again the return of one of the favourite characters, the Hood. But um, yeah, stick around and we'll, we'll delve straight into one of my other favourite episodes, the Cham Cham, which... Um, I love this episode, probably as much as I love the man from MI5 as well. You know, one of my personal favourites, so stick around for that one. F.A.B. F.A.B.